if I think it can stop. Um, Off you go, Steve, I think. Oh, it's not coming through. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Sorry about that. Uh, welcome to the Independent Sage briefing this afternoon. Um, so today, many people, we've experienced a, a dramatic change in the way that, that the COVID-19 pandemic impacts upon our daily lives. And increasingly, we're told by governments and everyone else that we must live with this virus. And some people even suggest, quite strangely, that we've reached a stable situation, that SARS coronavirus 2 is now no more troubling than inverted commas, a common cold. And of course, common colds can still cause many people problems. However, the problem is that, that such platitudes ignore those with vulnerabilities and rarely are the long-term implications and risks from infections discussed or indeed factored into things like vaccine programs. <clears throat> the reality is that people are still dying from the acute infection with this virus in their thousands, sadly. And we also have one to two million people living with long COVID. And the fact is that we remain in a constant and, and, and dynamic state of flux in terms of how the virus is evolving and continues to evolve and how this balances with our immunity, whether that's arising through vaccines or infection. So in the briefing today, we're gonna to consider how this ongoing, constantly changing situation affects all of us, but especially those individuals who are either vulnerable or are continuing to suffer from the longer term consequences of SARS-CoV-2 infection. We've got two fantastic guests who I'll introduce in a moment, but before we get to the main session, I'll invite Dr. Kit Yates to give us a presentation of the latest numbers and trends for this week. Over to you, Kit. Thanks very much, Steve. Hopefully you can all see my uh, slides now. So um, yeah, this is my, my last numbers session. Um, so I'm going to try and make it a good one. So uh, what I'm going to cover today is prevalence, hospitalizations, then deaths, a little bit on vaccination. And because we're talking about long COVID, I'm going to um, do a little bit of data on long COVID. Um, the picture on prevalence is clearly obfuscated by poor data. We've known that for a while now. Hospitalizations have been declining for the last couple of weeks. Deaths are still going up as a result of the hospitalizations we've seen previously. Uh, we're well into the autumn booster program now. Uh, but of course, we also need to remember, uh, as is the subject of today's session, that long COVID remains a serious problem. So um, just starting with prevalence, we don't have good data uh, since the ONS infection survey stopped. Um, the ZOE data also uh, stopped a couple of weeks ago, even though we know that had some issues. So what we're sort of resorting to at the moment is looking at positivity. Now, I don't think this is good to compare over time because we know that testing patterns changed in this gray region uh, that i've indicated on the right here but what uh, you can see at least is that the trend is is somewhat helpful so we can see that positivity is going down which suggests that prevalence is also decreasing and if you look at a regional level across different regions of england you can see uh, over the last four weeks that pretty much everywhere three or four weeks prevalence has been decreasing or positivity has been decreasing um so the gray bars are the longest time ago and the orange ones are the most recent so you can see that we've we've been seeing fairly consistent falls which hints that prevalence is also decreasing um hospitalizations are probably more accurate although we also know that they've been impacted by testing as well so here you can see um the hospitalization uh admissions uh, with COVID, uh, there was a change in testing policy earlier in the spring, which is indicated uh, by the grey line here. But you can see that hospitalizations were falling throughout the spring and into early summer. And then throughout summer and early autumn, they've been rising. And now for the last couple of weeks, they've been falling again, which is obviously good news. So we'd like to see that trend continue. Similarly, with occupied beds, you can see that that's tracking a similar trajectory to admissions. Um, falling and then rising and then uh, falling again over the last couple of weeks. Um, one metric which doesn't depend on testing policy is the number of mechanically ventilated beds. But you can see the same sort of trend tracking out there, a fall uh, over, the, over the early spring and early summer, and then rises over the summer and uh, into the early autumn and then slight falls again. So this, this, I think, with these four or five different corroborative sources of data suggests that cases and hospitalizations really are coming down deaths oh, in fact no i wanted to just slightly quickly cover flu um because it's that time of year when we need to start thinking about flu um this is a comparison of covid in red and flu in blue you can see flu is is still very low it hasn't been high since 
um, late spring of, of last year, and in particular, it was very high in January. It did overtake, overtake COVID very briefly uh, towards the end of last year and early this year. But you can see that COVID prevalence, uh, in fact, that this is hospital admissions uh, per 100,000 people. You can see that um, COVID is a much more significant problem for hospitals than flu is at any given time of year. And if I just show this chart that Duncan showed a couple of weeks ago, which is slightly updated now, you can see that uh, ever since the pandemic um, began, COVID has almost always been uh, a more significant problem than flu, with the exception of a two-week period last winter. So um, the argument should be that people should get their flu vaccination and that flu is obviously not trivial, but also that people should try and get their COVID vaccination when and if offered. Um, and perhaps we should be thinking about offering the COVID vaccination to more people, given how much of a problem COVID is for the NHS. Um, looking at deaths, um, we're seeing that they are still rising. This grey period highlighted the uh, right hand side indicates that we have got incomplete data there. But you can see that overall, the, case, the, the trend seems to be for deaths to be rising, which reflects the rises in cases and hospitalizations we saw previously. But hopefully, if this fall in hospitalizations is sustained, then we would expect to see those come down. But there's just a lag between people getting hospitalized and people dying and then those deaths being registered and reported. So we would expect to see this rise for a couple more weeks to come, perhaps. Uh, and that's that was the whole of the UK. This is just England. England makes up the majority of the population of the UK. So you can see that actually the trends are very, very similar um, in those in those two um, in those two graphs. Um, I want to talk briefly about vaccination. We're going on with the autumn vaccination program. So this is the number of people who've been vaccinated each week in England. And it, it's impressive. We got up to in the week ending the 8th of October, we got up to 2 million people vaccinated. Similarly, the week after that, but you can see that those numbers are starting to fall off. That's reflected in the total proportion of people who've been offered or who are eligible for the vaccine, who are actually vaccinated. You can see we got increases of 7% and then 10%, then lower to 9 and then to 7% and now 5%. So we would expect to see this levelling off, maybe around 50%, which I think is a little bit disappointing of all those people who are eligible. Only around 50% of them will probably end up getting the vaccine. We can hope that it will, it will continue to go up, uh, but it looks like it's starting to level off. Um, and this is a chart we often show of vaccine recency. So dark green is people who've been vaccinated within the last three months, light green is within three to six months. Orange is more than six months ago and red is unvaccinated. And so you can see that for the over 65s, people who are being offered the autumn booster, actually 61% of those people have taken up the offer, which is which is really good. Um, they've got re you know, recent protection from the vaccine. Um, 40 to 65s who are not being routinely offered, but the people who are, for example, immune suppressed, they're being offered uh, the vaccine, 12% of those. But then you can see this drops, so only 3% of 20 to 39s have been offered or taken up a vaccine in the last three months and 0% of, of children effectively five to 11s and 12 to 19s have um, had a vaccine within the last three months. Um, the last thing that I want to talk about is long COVID because that's partly the subject of the briefing today. We don't have good data on long COVID anymore. The ONS long COVID survey finished back in March, but I'm going to present the data for the six months leading up to the end of that survey, which suggested that the number of cases of long COVID, self-reported long COVID, just people saying they have symptoms longer than 12 weeks after their initial infection, it stayed roughly constant. So around 1.8, 1.7, 1 1.9 million people. So almost 2 million people with long COVID symptoms lasting for longer than 12 weeks. Now, over time during the pandemic, there's been a couple of really good studies that have come out actually this week, what REACT study and also a study co-authored by um, our independent sage colleague, Christina Pargel. And you can read about those studies on her substack. Um, but one of the main points that she makes and both of the papers make is that early on, the chances of getting long COVID if you got infected were quite high. So 16% of people who got infected were reporting symptoms a year later. So really, really large number. Now, as time has gone on, people have got infected, people have been vaccinated, and the variants have changed. The probability of getting long COVID if you get infected has fallen to maybe 2 or 3% now. But at the same time, the prevalence of COVID has significantly increased. We are getting far more people infected. And the effect that that has had is to make, as you can see in this chart, 
the overall number of people who've got long COVID stay roughly the same. Now, I, I can't guarantee that this is what's happened over the last six months, but there's no reason to believe that that has, uh, will have changed too much over time. So as people are recovering from long COVID, more people are getting infected and the numbers are staying roughly constant. Of those people who have um, long COVID for or symptoms for longer than 12 weeks, um, this is how it affects their day-to-day -day activities. 21% of people say it doesn't affect their day-to-day -day activities at all. Around 60% of people saying it affects the day-to-day -day activities a little. And then in red, 20% of people saying it in, uh, impacts their day-to-day -day activities a lot. And it's worth remembering that 20% of 2 million people is roughly 400,000 people. And so these are people who are now perhaps having to give up their jobs, which is um, stressful for them and also not great for the economy. This is people who are having to go for more routine healthcare appointments. They're going to have to put more burden on the NHS. And again, it's not good for them. And the, the thing that's often missed in the stats, you know, those are society level impacts. But of course, uh, for individuals, the, the impact of, of having this debilitating disease, particularly you know, mentally as well as physically, uh, can be absolutely massive, and that's something that we shouldn't we shouldn't neglect. Um, so, in summary, uh, prevalence looks like it's peaked, but it's difficult to know exactly what's happening. We have other corroborative sources like hospitalizations, which have been falling in the last couple of weeks. Deaths are rising, but again, we would expect those to fall in a couple of weeks' time because they're a lagged indicator compared to hospitalizations. The autumn booster program is still ongoing. We've achieved some, you know, decent numbers of vaccinations, but. Uh, it's a little bit disappointing that it looks like it will level out at 50 percent or so. And the last point is that um, and this is something that's worth bearing in mind with with the inquiry and people discussing different strategies, what we should have done. Should we have locked down earlier? And often those things are framed in terms of, well, if we would locked down earlier, we would have saved this many lives or we would have you know, made sure that hospitals weren't overwhelmed. It's also worth bearing in mind that back in the early stage of the pandemic, when rates of long covid were you know, maybe 16% of infections or maybe up to a quarter of infections led to long COVID. Letting so many people get infected meant that huge numbers of people got this debilitating condition who wouldn't have done if we had acted more quickly to control transmission. So I think long COVID is often ignored in, in the framing of these big picture discussions. So long COVID is having a significant impact on our health system, on our economy, and also it shouldn't be neglected for the people who have long COVID themselves. So that's where I'll stop and I will pass straight over to Len, who's going to give us a situation update. Thanks. Thanks, Kit. It's really impressive to see the data again. And it's just fascinating to see that we are coming up to our fourth year now and there's still waves happening. Um, and on top of that, we're going into winter where we normally see another wave, um, but four out of 10 people over the age of 65 haven't taken up the jab. So clearly, clearly more work to be done there. But thank you, Kit. Um, so I'm really glad to talk to you, everyone about our situational report. So for those who don't remember, we started to make ourselves incredibly topical at Independent Sage now and bringing you the latest news and, and our response to it. So here goes. And it's really continued over this autumn session. So that's great. Um, so three things that's been picked up in the last fortnight. Um, I'll go through them. Two of them are Lancet papers, which are quite fascinating, actually. And the third one really points to some of the good that Independent Sage has done, like Anthony. I'm going to point to him for the third, the third point. Um, so the first bit, um, about two weeks ago, the UK did another first. It looked at everyone in our NHS and our healthcare records and tried to work out who's still being affected. Um, it was called the INFORM study. Um, it looked at immunocompromised patients, 500,000, and, and then looked at our hospital records. And what that showed, which was probably in Lancet, and maybe we'll talk to it at next session, is that between one in three to one in four people who are being ended up in hospital last year uh, uh, um, and in ITU and dying from COVID are in that cohort. So I guess it really points to the fact that there is an issue and there's still people in hospital and it's disimpacting, it's impacting one group. Uh, the second news is another fascinating one. This paper, I think you might have seen it in the news. Um, so the University of Exeter has been doing this amazing study since 2014, um, which is called their Protex study. Um, every year they asked about 3,000 people above the age of 50 to do brain tests, brain quizzes, 
And interestingly enough, during the pandemic, they continued their quizzes and worked out what was happening to people's memory in these tests. They noticed during the pandemic, they saw that because of the effects of lockdown, people not seeing families, brain scores dropped by one to 2%. And they're monitoring this now because what they believe is that brain power is a bit like a muscle. You've got to keep using it. And if you're locked up, can't see people, then maybe this might have long-term consequences. Um, they found that the people whose brain power dropped during the pandemic, particularly during 2020, 2021, were people who were doing less exercise, um, drinking more, were depressed, had COVID or had high loneliness scores. So it's a really interesting research there um, and really points to the strengths that we've got in the UK about monitoring people over time. Right. And the big one now. This is what's hitting news all the time. Uh, the COVID inquiry. Um, it's just fascinating, isn't it? Because the inquiry is running for many years. It's got these modules about the care sectors, vaccines, procurement and preparedness. And actually, the one that's been hitting news the last two weeks, every week, basically, is module two, which is about UK decision making and uh, political governance. So the week before last, Anthony spoke uh, and I'll point to him shortly to tell us about his experiences and, he, and John Edmund spoke and Carl Heinegger, Neil Ferguson, Peter Hornby. And this week, we've been hearing a lot because we've had Dominic Cummings, Helen McNamara um, and Lee Kane talking too and sharing what happened during the pandemic and the COVID inquiry. Um, so I guess without further ado, I should probably talk to Anthony for a few minutes about what his experience was. Um, Anthony, over you. Do you want to update us in the COVID inquiry if you have time? Well, thank you, Leonard. Uh, unexpected. Um, yeah, it was interesting going there. And um, at first, you know, I had a session. I was probably on for about an hour and a half. I can't remember. The uh, barrister, Hugo Keith, was quite directive. And at first, I thought he was getting a bit pernickety when he was asking about independent sage. But actually, the barrister's job is to get various points across. So overall, I, when I rewatched it, I thought actually he did a very good job. I think he's a, a very skilled barrister and certainly looking at the later people. I'll just say one thing about what I felt I emphasised uh, was there's going to be, and we've had this week, some pretty garish and horrific um, evidence coming in about the bungling, the political shenanigans, the civil servant disputes and all the rest of it. But what I focused on and what I think is really important to remember is that very, very early on, January the 28th, to be precise, at the second SAGE meeting, uh, they made three or four unintentional false assumptions that they couldn't suppress the virus, that even if they did, there would be a huge second wave, that if they were going to suppress it, they would have to continue with awful lockdowns and stuff, and that they had to protect the economy. And for all those reasons, it went for a pandemic flu policy. And that was, a uh, looking back, a disastrous mistake because they, and I think you know, they didn't consult with the East Asian states, they didn't consult with WHO, and they didn't have any independent public health people on the uh, panel on that January the 28th. And as a result of that, there weren't any measures made to kind of set up advisory groups to say, how are we going to get a test quickly? How are we going to scale up our community health workers for contact tracing? How are we going to target hotspot areas and how are we going to set up a system for quarantine and isolation, which enables poor people to isolate? And as we know, and as we'll continue in the inquiry, all those things ran into huge logistic problems. But the whole key of it is act fast and have no regrets. And that was the point I was trying to get across, that there were some very fundamental problems at the beginning. I'm not blaming any individuals. It was a system issue. Uh, I think they they have very good people on Sage, but I don't think the balance of the people there was right. They should have had public health people, people in the front line, uh, social scientists, community development people and the like. And I think if they'd had independent public health people like uh, many people on the independent Sage, they would have uh, staggered that decision about going a pandemic flu rate, a uh, flu route, and they would have thought more about how coronavirus infections are very different. 
So that was the key thing that I was trying to get across. And But it is fascinating listening and finding out what actually went on and how dysfunctional things were uh, in, as we've seen with many of the civil servants and stuff. And the, it's been very revealing and, and quite shocking. I'll just leave one thing. Um, at the end, I did speak to some of the bereaved families, which was very powerful. There's several representatives who sit through the sessions. And it was very moving because, you know, I spoke to someone who lost their father, another person who lost their their uh, husband and son uh, as a frontline worker. And it brings home to you that 228,000 people have died. And if we'd done what South Korea did, and I don't see any reason why we couldn't have done, 150,000 lives would have been saved. But I'll stop there. Thanks, Anthony. I guess it really, I wasn't independent sage there, but thank you for everything you've done and for the group, because independent sage has been pushing transparency and public communications, and it's fantastic. And that's the situation we report. I'll go back to Steve. Thanks very much. And and thanks, Anthony, for your insight. And I think everyone agrees that your, your testimony was really, really, really brilliant and sharp. Um, so back to the main session for today, then. And, and as I alluded to before, what we're really going to be considering today is how this dynamic situation with the virus and how it evolves and our immunity and vaccines and variants interplay all affect the plight of those who are most vulnerable with respect to both disease and, of course, long COVID. And what we really are faced with here is that the levels of surveillance, as Kit alluded to, the details of data and really our overall awareness of COVID have been much reduced. We have, have we, as we've heard, access to vaccines has been limited and indeed access to antivirals is now more difficult for many people. We have a, an absorption of our long COVID specialist clinics back into standard practice. And it, the upshot is that, that, that our vulnerable and clinically vulnerable and socioeconomic vulnerable people have just suffered from the withdrawal of virtually all attempts for us to keep up with the pandemic in the UK. And this is what we're calling living with the virus. So are we right as a nation to stand still? Or if not, how should we or could we keep pace with this virus? And is it really only the vulnerable, in inverted commas, who actually require better protection? Or as long COVID, I think, shows us, do we all need to do this? So to discuss all of this, we've got two incredible guests with us today. <clears throat> First of all, we have Ryan Heisner, who anyone who's on Twitter probably will have heard of. He's actually a full-time science and maths teacher at a small high school in Indiana in the USA. But despite not having any biology qualifications until hopefully the near future, Ryan has built an incredible reputation as a self-taught SARS-CoV-2 variant hunter. And he's actually co-authored several peer-reviewed publications, including a recent paper in Nature. So don't need to go the traditional academic route all the time, folks. So he continues his incredible sleuthing work on how the virus is evolving. And he's now studying part-time for a master's um, in, in the University of Cape Town in South Africa. And our second guest is Alexandra Tabashnikova. And she's actually an immunobiology PhD student in the laboratory of Professor Akiko Osaki at Yale University. And Akiko was due to join us um, today, but unfortunately she's got a respiratory virus infection and has lost her voice, cruel irony. And what Sasha studies is the human chronic immune diseases, and in particular long COVID, and specifically how the reactivation of other viruses in our bodies may contribute to the pathogenesis of this condition. And prior to this, she um, did her degree at Columbia University and has been working at Mount Sinai and other places looking at tumours and microenvironments, but her, her main focus now is on long COVID. So now I'm going to, without further ado, hand over to Aris, who's going to talk um, to Ryan about the evolution of this virus that we're all experiencing in the pandemic. Over to you, Alex. Yeah, hi. Um, yeah, great great to have a chance to, to talk with you uh, in, in, in person. So um, could you tell us a little bit about, about testing and, and what's happened to surveillance for, for SARS-CoV-2 sequences uh, in recent months and, and sort of contrast that with, with the earlier phases of the pandemic? Uh, me, right? You asking me? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, the sequencing, it, it's kind of varied. We have some countries that have maintained a pretty good level of sequencing. Recently, France is really up theirs a lot. And so they've been doing really good sequencing. And then we have other countries. Germany is, is one that has almost stopped completely, really, sequencing. Um, as well as a lot of uh, countries where there wasn't much sequencing to begin with. And now there's basically, it's just a blank space. 
that we don't really know. Um, so overall, it's down. It's it's uh, it's not as dire as it could be. Um, but I think the biggest concern really is is those sort of blank areas of the world, especially Central South Asia, um, almost all of Africa, where you know something could be emerging, and we really we really wouldn't know for a long time uh, because of the lack of surveillance. So in, in, in terms of whether it matters then, I, I think, c c could you, h how do you think our, these blind spots in terms of viral evolution might impact our, our ability to, to have a sense of what's out there and, and to respond to this dynamic challenge? Uh, it's probably mostly a timing thing, you know, so whereas you would have uh, detected something, you know, pretty immediately after its emergence, it might take several months. Um, and even if there's sequencing in those places, sometimes they don't upload the sequences for several months. Um, that happened with when the BQ variant first came out. You know, later on, we got some sequences, I think, from Nigeria, but um, that were from pretty early, earlier than the other ones. But they were uploaded four months after they were collected, you know, and so we didn't really see those. Um, so it's, it's mainly a timing thing, you know. So we we built up this really rich picture of, of virus evolution through the great surveillance that we had in the early years of the pandemic, and we we you know we've all come to know that the alpha, the delta, the omicron variants, um, the the beta variant was picked up really really quickly in, in South Africa because because of the very rich surveillance that that, that they had. Um, how is the, how is virus evolution happening now in the omicron era? So what does it look like on on, on a global scale? Well, it's it's constantly changing. Um, and really, at this point, it's kind of hard to talk about just one virus. We have some really very diverse uh, viruses that are in circulation. I mean, we have the XBB variants, which vary within themselves, but are kind of their own class. Um, and then we have, you know, BA.2.86, um, which is very different. Um, and we, we still have some of the Delta Omicron recombinant uh, variants, especially in Australia, still have XBC is one of them, um, and also uh, some some of the CH11, which is a BA275 descendant, um, which is which is quite a bit different, um, is also still circulating uh, pretty widely. It picked up the flip mutation, as we call it, um, and it's it's sort of gained new life. So there's still a lot of stuff out there. It's very different. Um, as far as how you know how is it changing you know the biggest thing is uh you know it's still evolving trevor bedford had recently had a study that came out that showed that it was uh that you still had antigenic antigenic evolution of sars cov2 that's more than twice as fast as h3n2 uh influenza which is about as fast as which is much much uh, faster than other viruses so it hasn't really slowed down you know, a lot of people said that, well, you know, initially, as soon as the, you know, in the pandemic phase, there's going to be maybe this rapid evolution because it wasn't adapted to humans and then it was going to slow down. And we really haven't seen that. It really seems to be evolving as rapidly um, as it ever has. Um, and, you know, the other factor is that, you know, with BA286, um, a lot of people were thinking that um, you, you know, we had these sort of divergent variants emerge from chronic infections, really, which has played a huge role. And a lot of people were saying, well, you know, we've got population immunity now, and so that's not going to happen anymore in the future. Um, but then, you know, BA2, A6 came out, and clearly that's still a thing that can happen. Um, whether it'll continue to happen in the future, I think, is, is an important question. Um, but, yeah. Yeah, so, so I guess... <laughs> You know, we're still seeing the, this change over time, and you know, and maybe in the past people were worried about intrinsic virulence, and now I think you know you're, you're rightly pointing to immunity and immune escape as being the the the, the really important property that that that, that we should be monitoring. Um, in in terms of what we can predict from where we are, where where do you think we stand? Like, what what could we predict about the evolution of this virus over the coming months or or even years? I, in the short term, there's a lot of predicting, I feel like, that you can do. So, for example, the what we call the flip variants, which are, they have two uh, consecutive mutations in the receptor binding uh, domain, L455F and F456L. Um, they're growing quickly, and they're 
pretty certain to dominate the XVB um, variants. Um, it looked like they were definitely going to become dominant overall, but, but with the emergence of BA286, uh, that's not so not so clear anymore. Um, so you can see trends for a few months out, sort of. You know, you can you can look at the growth the growth rates very early on, and you can see clearly that if something's growing in a number of different countries, um, uh, that you know it's probably going to continue to grow. Um, after that, I don't think there's a whole lot you can predict. You know, it's uh, you know, after a couple months out, it's sort of a, it's sort of a crapshoot. Um, you know, I don't think nobody really anticipated uh, the flip mutation. I think emerging, which um, for people who aren't familiar with that, it's it's two mutations that are adjacent, and one of them emerged first, and it was an antibody evasion mutation, but 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 it imposed a, a hit in ACE two affinity, you know, and so it was uh, kind of weakened the virus in that way. But the second mutation actually reversed that ACE2 affinity loss and made it a gain, as well as increasing the antibody evasion. And so it was this combination of two consecutive uh, mutations, which, by the way, it, um, that, that uh, double mutation had been seen over a year earlier in at least a dozen different sort of chronic infection sequences. Um, so... It's very similar to a lot of other things. You see some of these mutations that later become dominant. You see them emerge in these just chronic infection sequences that don't go anywhere. You know, they're not transmitting at the time. Um, but it's just basically a chronic infection that's fighting against a host immune response, possibly against uh, antiviral treatments. And uh, we tend to see those mutations uh, of the future sort of previewed um, in those patients. And so that's one way it's it's a very fuzzy preview though it's not you can't sort of like read you know the future based on the tea leaves of the you know the chronic infection mutations but it is at least i think it's useful so could, do you think i mean do we have any hope of predicting the likelihood of another omicron like event like the emergence of a whole other variant of concern that's going to be as different to, to what troubled us when when omicron came onto the scene i think unfortunately that's that's just a total unknown really uh, at this point, you know, we still, <clears throat> most of the, you know, really highly divergent sort of chronic infection like sequences we see now are, are Omicron derived from one or another Omicron uh, lineage, including BA1. Um, we see a lot of, but uh, the BA1 had, they didn't ha hardly ever transmit. For some reason, the BA2 descendants um, that are, you know, really highly divergent, um, a lot of those have sort of taken off. Um, BA1 never really has, so not really, it's not really clear why. But we also occasionally still see, you know, Delta derived, um, extremely divergent chronic infection Delta ones, or even earlier, we see ones from from 2020, you know, B1 or B11. Um, so those things are still out there. Um, whether or not <clears throat> they have the capability to transmit, or whether um, one will do that. I think it's anybody's guess. I mean, there's no shortage of them out there. Um, we see them in the sequences. There's, you know, every day I keep a list of them and every day there's new ones. Um, but most of them never transmit, you know, people who are chronically infected. And a lot of them don't even have, there's been some studies done um, where they've sort of tracked uh, patients who are known to be chronically infected. And a lot of them don't even have very many mutations. There's nothing really very remarkable. Um, but we definitely see ones that, that do have, you know, 20 new spike mutations or, or more, um, in the sequencing. And, uh, it's, it's actually a little bit mysterious why some of them transmit and then go and take off, you know, like the, like BA1 or BA2 or, or BA2, A6 and why others don't, there's no obvious, there's no obvious difference that says, oh, well, this is why this one took off and this is why this one didn't, um, so it's it's kind of a mystery, but I think it's it's something that we definitely need to keep in mind, especially if you know if we had, um, I mean you you had a great paper where you talked about the, uh, you know the sort of myth that it's just going to become milder over time, um, you know we may gain some immunity to it and that may tend to make disease less severe, but as far as the inherent severity of the virus, it's kind of a crapshoot really. Um, and we could have, you know, something emerge that really sort of reverted to a more Delta type 
um, disease severity. And that would be, the, you know, the worst case scenario, probably. So is there any hope of the, the, the virus sort of settling into a regular seasonal pattern as, as a sort of other seasonal respiratory viruses that, that, that we're more familiar with in, in the very near future? Doesn't look like it in the very near future. <laughs> um, as far as further out than that, maybe, you know, who knows? I mean, basically, you have to have the antigenic evolution slow down enough uh, to, to more of an influenza or a seasonal coronavirus pattern so that you don't have more than one, <laughs> you know, annual wave. And right now that's not happening. It's not slowing down. Um, and whether that's due to it being, you know, still relatively novel, not as novel as it was a couple of years ago, um, or whether there's something sort of inherent, you know, about this virus that it's just going to be something that mutates really quickly um, for a long time and will never become seasonal. Um, we hope not, but but it, I think it's hard to say at this point, you know, um, and especially the aspect of, of the chronic infections where uh, you tend to have accelerated evolution in those. Um, and so are those going to continue, you know, and where we see huge jumps in, uh, you know, in the in the spike mutations that can evade, you know, previous immunity and vaccination? Um, it's an open question, but I think uh I think it's something that we definitely need to think about. Well, thank you. I'd, I'd actually love to ask all sorts more questions, but I think I will hand over to, to Steve to, to have a go at a, a couple of, que of a question of his own. <laughs> thanks, Aris. And thanks, Ryan. Really, really amazing insights. And I think it's safe to say um, that we probably aren't going to struggle to keep um, trying to just tweak mRNA vaccines to keep up with this thing as we keep going forwards. It isn't influenza. Um, so we were going to discuss a lot more about vaccines today, but we've actually got a load of public questions around vaccines. So we're going to leave it to that part. And I'm going to hand back over to Sheena now, who's going to talk to Sasha about our immunity and how that's working in for, involved with, with long COVID. So over to you, Sheena. OK, so thank you so much, Sasha, for, for being our, our hero and coming and stepping in. So. Um, given the kind of severe acute disease, and that and we are seeing a lot more of that potentially because of all the reduction in vaccination, we'll talk more about vaccination later, but we know this, that more people who have severe disease are more likely to get long COVID. So are you concerned that countries, as they're kind of rolling back vaccine programs and as we're seeing greater vaccine hesitancy, which is something we talked a lot about in the last session, are you concerned that we're going to see the long COVID situation sort of further deteriorate? Uh, yeah, absolutely. And, and thank you for having me. Um, I, I think, you know, we, we know there, there are studies that show that vaccination decreases your chance of getting long COVID. So keeping up with the vaccine schedule, having that vaccine schedule, I think is one of the only things that we know that we can do to prevent getting long COVID other than everything else that protects you from getting COVID. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I do want to say that even people who don't have serious COVID-19 infection, even people who are asymptomatic have gotten long COVID. So just preventing that infection is really the main thing you can do. Absolutely. And actually, we've also got evidence as well that people with who already have long COVID vaccination can sort of, sort of help their symptoms from getting worse because um, we do unfortunately see that. So it's really quite disappointing that this isn't factored into some of the decision making about accessibility. Now, you recently were involved in the publication of some important papers that have been looking at uh, long COVID, particularly there's some really lovely work that's come from the, the lab looking at physiological markers of long COVID, and these correlate really well with self-reporting. So what insights are these giving us in terms of how this disease arises? And perhaps you can tell us a little bit more about that work for people who are less familiar. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, it was a it was a huge team effort. Um, there's seven co-first authors of us, um, and then there's uh, four corresponding authors. So it was a collaboration with Dr. David Petrino at Mount Sinai, who uh, it runs a long COVID clinic there. So all of our participants in the study were recruited from Mount Sinai. Uh, patients referred to that clinic by their clinician for having long COVID. Um, and then, you know, it's a cross-sectional study, so it's a single time point of blood collection, as well as survey collection of extensive 
you know, long COVID symptomatology, electronic medical records, so any sort of pre-existing conditions, um, their course of hospitalization or lack of hospitalization for COVID-19. Um, and I think really there were, and afterwards, you know, we conducted a large amount of immunophenotyping. So we looked at um, circulating immune cells that were in those blood samples. We looked at a lot of different factors that can be found in the plasma of blood. So looking at antibody responses to both SARS-CoV-2 and other viral pathogens. Um, we looked at different, um, you know, hormones and immune signaling molecules that are in the plasma. Um, and then we also conducted a machine learning approach uh, to sort of consolidate this huge amount of data and, and really be able to drive into what are the things that distinguish people who have long COVID from those that don't. Um, and so I think, you know, one, one key finding that we really want to highlight is that based on just the surveys, uh, so which symptoms people with long COVID are participating, you know, we're able to train a model that can distinguish with 94% accuracy whether or not somebody has long COVID as compared to people who either recover completely from infection or were never infected and are healthy. Um, and so I think that points to the importance of people who have long COVID, who describe having these symptoms, those are real symptoms. We're able to distinguish those people from people who recover from COVID-19. Um, and then when we look at those immunological markers, we are able to, again, discriminate long COVID participants. We're able to see which things are different. And so I think some of the findings there that I want to highlight um, in terms of the uh, immune cell populations, we do see increased T cell exhaustion, um, as well as uh, a certain type of activation of T cells. We also see more activation of B cells um, and more double negative B cells. And so I think you know that T cell activation and exhaustion is pointing to sort of continued stimulation. Same thing with the increase in activated B cells. I think for us, that was one of the findings of the study that points to some sort of, again, chronic potential exposure to something that is activating them, whether that is specifically SARS-CoV-2 chronic exposure and potentially a reservoir is you know, exactly what we're testing next. Um, we also looked at antibodies to SARS-CoV-2, and we saw that participants who have long COVID have higher levels of antibodies to SARS-CoV-2. Again, potential uh, evidence that they're being continuously exposed to that antigen, so they're producing more antibodies. They're being triggered to produce more of those antibodies. But we also saw higher levels of antibodies to some herpes viruses. And so herpes viruses, once you are infected, you're infected for life but they're mostly maintained just genetically and they're not actually producing active viral infection. Um, but what we saw was higher levels of antibodies to Epstein-Barr virus and varicella zoster virus. So Epstein-Barr virus is the virus that causes mononucleosis um, and varicella zoster virus is the virus that causes chicken pox and then shingles in adults. Um, and so again, I think the, the higher level of antibodies is not accidental. I think it points to a more recent reactivation of those viruses. So more recent, again, exposure of the immune system to those viruses. So one of the hypotheses that we're very excited to test is whether or not um, a acute SARS-CoV-2 infection can trigger the reactivation of some of these latent herpes viruses um, and, and how that plays into the development of long COVID. And then I really think the, the sort of strongest um, striking finding that we saw and this was the most you know, distinct difference between people who have long COVID and don't, is that people who have long COVID have lower levels of cortisol. And so this is something that we see in, in diseases like chronic fatigue syndrome um, that has been found before and, and could explain, you know, cortisol is, is the hormone produced under stress, but it's also the hormone that's produced you know, early in the morning when you're waking up. It's kind of the thing that gets you going during the day. Um, and so I think it can explain some of the fatigue and, and, and sort of brain fog type symptoms that people with long COVID describe. Um, if they're not producing the right amount of cortisol to start their day, that would explain some of those things. Um, and so, yeah, that's another, you know, hypothesis. Why, why are we seeing this reduction of cortisol that we're, we're trying to test in the future? And, and super, super briefly, um, because we need to get on these public questions, that was that was really clear about the sort of immune activation, the change in phenotype. 
and this change in cortisol. How do you think this is going to help us be able to treat people with long COVID in the future? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, again, I think it points to some potential causes of long COVID. So I think, you know, already at, at Yale, we have started a, a trial of long COVID participants getting Paxlovid. So addressing the potential persistence of the virus, can, if we can try to get rid of the virus, are they going to start feel, to feel better? Um, I think targeting those herpes viruses might be another potential avenue. Um, you know, maybe some hormonal type therapies to replenish the amount of cortisol. So I think there's a lot of avenues that you can take with treatment here. The first step to treatment is really defining what is a disease and being able to diagnose it, right? So I think some of these findings that we have could in the future be translated to biomarkers that we can really do a blood test, say that person we can diagnose confidently with long COVID, and then try to try a range of different treatments based on which one of these parameters they have perturbed. That's really helpful. Thank you so much. That was really clear. I'm going to pass over to Steve now so we can bring in our public questions. Thank Fantastic. You. Fantastic. Thank you, Sheena. Thank you, Aris. And thank you to our guests who just got some brilliant insights there. I'm going to move, as Sheena says, very quickly, public questions, because there's a lot of relevant questions in here. And I hope our guests will be able to contribute to that. And we're very lucky, actually, um, to have four um, members of the public to ask questions here today um, on our live session. So could I ask, first of all, Claire? from the Long COVID Advocacy Group to unmute and reveal yourself and ask your question, please. Hi, Claire. Yeah, um, hi, uh, just say thank you to Sasha for a really great um, description of Long COVID and all the research going on at Yale. So uh, my question is, in the COVID inquiry, we heard that Boris Johnson thought Long COVID was excuse my language, bollocks, and Gulf War syndrome stuff. Why do you think he thought that? And why do these false beliefs exist in some of the highest echelons of power? Thank you, Claire. Um, who would like to deal with that one, folks? Um, is there an answer to that, I wonder? Does anyone have any thoughts? <laughs> I think um, um, Sasha's going to add something in a minute, but I, I do find this really peculiar that this, this keeps happening. And so often in the, the dialogue about COVID, long COVID is just not mentioned. Yeah. And I think one of the issues is it's complex. Sasha's beautifully described how complex it is, but equally it is 100% real. And the work that Sasha and others are doing is, is showing that there are real changes mm -hmm. to our immunology, to our body that are causing these symptoms. So it's 100% real. I wonder if Sasha wants to come in. Sasha, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I, I want to say, I think it's really disturbing that politicians hold these views. Um, I think what's even more disturbing is that we're still having to convince the scientific and medical community yeah. that this is also a real phenomenon. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, I think that's the first step is if we can reach a consensus as a scientific yeah. and medical community, then that won't um, empower these politicians to say <laughs> statements like that. Absolutely. Trish, did you want to say something quickly? Yeah, just to sort of put on my clinical hat. I'm a GP, but I'm working um, with some people who are running long COVID clinics, both in the community and in hospitals. Um, it's very interesting, the, the material that Sasha has presented from one of the top labs in the world. Uh, but it's, we also need to take on board that right now in clinic, there is no biomarker for long COVID. There's potential biomarkers and there's all sorts of research going on. And it looks like at some point there will be biomarkers, but right now there is no blood test or X-ray or any other test that you can do to say, this person has got a biological condition called long COVID. Uh, so no wonder that there's a lot of leeway there if, for the people who, who don't wanna uh, say that this is a real condition. The second thing is that clinically, most people who get acute COVID get better, and then some people don't. So that opens the door to an explanation that says, well, the ones that don't must be imagining what they've got. Uh, and if you, we had Eric Topol on a, a few months back, you know, mm. these are top, top immunologists, and they're saying there's something going on. But as Sheena said, it's not straightforward. But the other thing that I think we need to uh, talk about to, to 
come back to the question is why are some senior politicians saying, well, this just doesn't exist? Um, and, and the expletive and the kind of really quite aggressive dismissal of this as a, as a possibility. Of course, if long COVID exists, we have, uh, you know, something like a million people to, to look at a conservative estimate who are not currently uh, 100%. And many of those are unable to work and they're going to need long term support. And that's not something that a politician is going to like. So let's just write it off. Um, so I think there there is a bit of um, there, there are some reasons why politicians might like to say that this doesn't exist. But I think we've heard some really excellent arguments from Sasha today that, that you know, if you're looking at, at um, the top labs, they are finding abnormalities. Um, and so it's, it's just not scientifically plausible to say this this condition is all in the mind. It clearly is not all in the mind. Absolutely. Very quickly, Anthony. Yeah, very quickly. I mean, all of us seek evidence based policy that we try and collect evidence and come to a consensus and then hope that policy. But most um, uh, politicians don't do that. They do policy based evidence. They say, what do we want to do? And at the time, you know, like Boris Johnson and Rishi Sunak were desperate to just open everything up. And when people were saying, look, this could be a long term, bro they didn't want to know it. And so the problem with social media is that you can always find some people putting an opposite view, even amongst doctors. Mm. And so that's one of the problems. And we're seeing exactly the same with climate change yeah. and that they pick that's up on that. the climate skeptics. So we have a real problem with this, that, that um, a lot of these conspiracists and disinformation experts are influencing politicians in a way that's damaging. Agreed. Thanks very much, Anthony. So, Claire, I hope that answers partly your question. I don't know if there is a real answer to that. And I'll just ask Susan now to um, unmute and ask her question very quickly, if that's OK. Susan, well. Yes, hello. Um, I want to know what help is there for those of us who've had long COVID for three or more years? And the reason I ask this is because my own long COVID clinic refused a re-referral, saying they did what they could at the one year mark with six online group sessions called Learning to Live with Long COVID, and they've nothing else to offer. Similarly, my GP, lovely though she is, and bits I know more about Long COVID than she does, and says she can't do anything. So we're left alone. And I found even the National um, Health Service National Workshop in Birmingham in the summer on Long COVID, which was full of passionate people about Long COVID, Nobody talked about long COVID beyond the initial support. So we're, we're, we're here from 2020. We're still ill. A lot of us like me not able to work. What help is there? Yes, I think Trish will probably have a very definitive answer for you. I, I certainly don't have a definitive answer, but I do. Um, <laughs> I, I, I feel for you. It's, it's absolutely ghastly condition. Now, long COVID is defined at, or persistent COVID-19 syndrome is defined differently by different groups, but uh, it's either four or 12 weeks, depending on which definition you take. Um, in other words, if you've still got symptoms, four weeks or, or 12 weeks, then you've got long COVID. Um, we're now seeing people who have had COVID for two years or more, and those people were not the people for whom the long COVID service in UK was designed for. It was designed as a rehabilitation service, as you're painfully aware. You've been, you've, you've, you've done this, haven't you, Susan? You've been to the physiotherapy, you've been to the occupational therapy, you've probably had a bit of psychology input and a bit of rehabilitation back to work input. Uh, and actually, that's all very well if you are getting better. But we now know that a small proportion, a small, very unfortunate proportion of people with long COVID are not getting better. And they they haven't made any progress in many, many months. Um, we're starting to call this long, long COVID mm. or Manoj Sivan from Leeds calls it long COVID as a long term condition. And 
I think we need a completely different model. We're actually in the middle of writing a grant application to the NIHR to look specifically at this cohort of people. But right now, I can see why the clinics are saying, well, there's no point seeing you, because actually they are so oriented towards that rehab model that they probably don't have a lot to offer you. But that's absolutely devastating if you're one of those people. So we can't do that. You can't just tell me you're not going to see me. Somebody's got to design a service that does address um, the symptomatology that, that you've got. And I, and I think that has to be a service that looks at underlying mechanisms. Uh, and there are one or two places in the UK that do that. But right now we've got a real mismatch between the long COVID services and, and this uh, cohort of long haulers, if you like, um, for which the, those services were, were just not designed. Great. Thanks ever so much, Trish. Sasha, extremely quickly in minus three seconds, please. Yes, uh, just one quick addition. You know, I think part of part of it is that as researchers, right, we need to study these patients as well. I think a majority of long COVID studies published now, just by nature of what's easiest to collect and the fact that science takes time, uh, look at people, you know, three to six months after their mm -hmm. acute infection. So, you know, our, our study, the median time out from infection was over a year, and these are still people experiencing all of these symptoms. So hopefully as time continues, more studies will be done on people who have, to quote you, long, long COVID. So I think that will help, I hope as well, to identify that these are still biological underpinnings. Yeah, completely agree. Thanks, Susan. I hope that's been helpful. I'm going to have to move on now, I'm afraid, to our third guest, who's Dr. Avaral Vatsa. So, uh, Avaro, would you like to unmute and ask your question, please? Hi there. Thank you for uh, allowing me to uh, pose a question. And thanks a lot, Independent um, Sage, all, all these all these months and years um, for providing this evidence-based information. This is the go-to place for, for people like me. My question quickly is, I mean, uh, currently we see that there's very little information going around about COVID, even in UK, but there are also many places around the world where COVID information just doesn't exist. The narrative is gone from public. Um, they think that it's gone forever. And we have seen that from the COVID inquiry that what uh, you know, organizations like Independent Sage provided initially, those things have stood the test of time. And if policymakers would have listened to it, things would have been different. So my question today is, what are those you know, concise steps if we could uh, propose to policymakers or governments or, or, or even doctors you know, who don't have access to uh, the information we are talking about, if they could implement that and so that the, the, the impacts of COVID from today onwards can be mitigated? Um, because there is so much which is just, just not known. People have just turned blind eye to it from today onwards. Thank you. So who would like to hand that? Of course, prevalence is the root of all evil, as we know, as we've heard a lot today. Has anyone anyone got any thoughts on this? Well, I guess uh, at the risk of regurgitating what we've said many times, I think that, that, that we need a population scale mitigation strategy. We need, um, you know, ventilation improvements. We need masking where necessary. We need improve, improved vaccines. Uh, Kit, did you have something to add? Yeah, I just I think in terms of getting information to the people that need it, um, I think that's what we've been trying to do on Independent Sage for the last few years. It would be great if the scientists who were advising the government at the time when the pandemic was in its acute phase felt able to communicate more openly with the public. I think there were various reasons why they didn't feel able to do that. And part of it stems from ensuring that the scientific advice is independent from the people who are taking that advice and i think that that was what independent sage was set up to do to give a platform for genuinely scientists who had nothing nothing to do with the politicians who couldn't be influenced by the politicians to to be able to speak their truths uh openly without fear of reprisals and i think that one way of at least getting information out uh to the public is is to have genuinely independent scientific advice and advisors who are able to communicate effectively with the public because if we are asking the public to undergo restrictions based on scientific advice we owe it to them to explain the science behind those restrictions so i think um yeah independence of scientific advice is super important to get the message out yeah well said kit and sabeda did you have something quickly to add yeah i uh, well i just want to add that it's absolutely essential that we still get 
information out because as we've all acknowledged, we're still in a pandemic. Prevalence is still very, very high. And the most important aspect of that is that risk for many groups have not changed. We know that certain groups were extremely vulnerable during the pandemic, like an ethnic minority groups, CEV groups, disabled people. We know that all of those groups were very, very vulnerable. We know that there are issues around vaccine hesitancy and vaccine take up among some of those groups. Even in the case of long COVID, we know that women, those who are older, those who live in deprived areas, those who have pre-existing health conditions, all of those groups are very vulnerable to long COVID. And as we've learned today, that infection, more infection that you have, more likely you are to get long COVID. So it's absolutely essential that that information is still out there and absolutely essential that we don't pretend that COVID is over because it isn't. Okay, great. So in the interest of time, we're, we're running slightly over, so I'm just going to move to our fourth guest. Um, oh, sorry, who is that? No, sorry, sorry, uh, sorry, Steve. Just to add, just to add, just one line that there are millions of people out there, unfortunately, who are having symptoms of long COVID, and they don't even know that it is long COVID. Mm, um, yeah. and that is, I feel quite, uh, you know, frustrated about that. Thank you, thank completely you for agree. Me Completely agree. Well said. Well said. So, thank you, thank you. Sorry to rush you. Um, can I have our our last guest, who's uh, Glenn Huskerson, asking a question about therapeutics? Can you unmute and unmask, Lynn? Okay, Glenn, we, we can't hear you. I think you are muted. Perhaps we could cover the oh, yeah. question I'll, I'll, I'll of just the vaccines quickly. that we were going to do while, while Glenn's sorting out there. System. Sure. Okay. So, Glenn, we'll come back to you in a second. Um, we're going to read out a, a question um, around vaccines, um, and probably Sheena, the best to ask, answer this. Uh, this is from Stephen Lowe. And Sheena, what is the progress on nasal vaccination for COVID? Well, I'm going to I'm going to roll back a little bit before we jump to nasal vaccine, just to explain mm -hmm. why we're talking about those. So with, with vaccination, we do know that the vaccines, the largely tar targeted spike, which is the thing that the virus uses to latch onto our cells and get in. Now, the mRNA vaccines have worked really well. They've given us a nice kind of surge in antibodies that we can measure in our blood. But naturally over time, that level will fall because the B cells that provide that, that Sasha was talking about earlier, they gradually die off. So you don't end up with sort of persistence in the blood. What you're left with thereafter is a little bit of, of memory that is provided for your cells that you find in your bone marrow largely that can make a bit of antibodies. As long as you get memory cells, but you also get long-lived plasma cells. So these are really important to keeping, keeping things going, but that's not enough to stop breakthrough infections. And that is why we have boosters. Now, the, the, this is where the, this sort of thinking comes in because we know that we see something called waning immunity. That's one of the reasons that we have boosters is to top up those levels to stop breakthrough infections. But we also have, so we heard from Ryan today, we've got a virus that keeps mutating. It's changing spike. That means it's getting more and more able to hide from our immune system. So we have to keep changing the vaccines. So when you're looking at new vaccines, you need to think about both of those things. They are not the same. Now, one of the reasons we're thinking about different types of vaccines is we want something that's a bit more durable. So one of the approaches is to do kind of multivariant vaccines that perhaps have lots of different parts of, of the virus in it, because that might be more resistant to subsequent changes that Ryan's been discussing. The other thing is that we don't just get memory cells and that circulate in our blood, or we get these long-lived plasma cells in our bone marrow. We get memory cells in our tissues, but we don't get those very well from um, mRNA vaccines or any kind of vaccine that we put in our arm. We get it better when we actually have the infection or a vaccine in the tissue. That's why we need mucosal vaccines like nasal vaccines. And that's the kind of thing that also Akiko's lab's been doing a, a lot on. 
Now, the nasal vaccines are looking incredibly promising for giving us more durable immunity that will hopefully protect better from infection. They are in clinical trials in the States. So let's watch this space. Um, they are being used in countries like China. At the moment, I have heard nothing in the UK to suggest that we are looking at any of these other types of technology. I suspect we may buy some of these technologies in once they are sort of um, better established in other countries. But I wish I could say that we're going to get nasal vaccines next year or even that we're going to get Nova vaccine, which is a, a not... Um, I think just I think I've misquoted it, but there's a type of vaccine that's looking particularly good of the kind of in your arm type that's that lasting a bit longer. But um, no, it doesn't look like we're getting that one yet in the UK. So we just have to keep watching this space. I don't know if Sasha wants to add anything very quick. Sure. Uh, yeah, I think you know. I mean, you stated it absolutely beautifully, but I, I think part of part of you know what we hope to accomplish with the mucosal vaccine with the nasal vaccine is yes, more durable immune response, but also that local immune response so that it is right there. It's primed and ready to go. And you can have something called sterilizing immunity and actually prevent that even initial infection. Because right now, most of the vaccines are so effective at preventing severe disease, but we know that there are breakthrough infections. We know that people can still get infected even when they're fully vaccinated. Great. Thank you, Sasha. Thank you, Sheena. And of course, there are always two sides to this, the virus and the vaccine. Um, Glenn, have you got any opportunity to unmute? If not, I will read out your question. Ah. Hi. Yes, you're there. Can you hear me? Yes. Seems that my camera isn't working. We can see and hear you. It's fine. Oh, OK. Right. Um, we're seeing a growing number of clinically vulnerable, including the immunosuppressed, who are having serious problems accessing the approved treatments when we have COVID. It appears some hospitals have no stocks and at least some ICBs are not purchasing stocks. What treatments are the immunosuppressed and clinically vulnerable with COVID supposed to receive? And what, in your view, should we be receiving? Thanks, Glenn. That's a really important question. Who would like to take that? Sasha? I can speak a little bit to it. Um, you know, I, I live in the United States, so I, I don't know what the you know official UK guidance is, but you know, certainly somebody who's immunosuppressed may not be able to mount the proper immune response, generate the proper antibodies. So something like monoclonal antibodies, that this is one of the areas where we're still absolutely treating people with monoclonals as if they're immunosuppressed or um have an autoimmune disease. Len, do you have any? experience of this lack of provision? Yeah, I think the challenge that we've always had in the pendant stage is getting the data out there and the information out there. And I guess the tricky thing is that this data is not available. Uh, in the absence of that, I think it's really important for systems to listen to patients, to have their voices heard and brought to the right places. Um, we're very grateful for Glyn for doing working very hard in this space and everyone within groups who are trying to access healthcare at the moment. We want to be in a situation where people don't have to fight for access to healthcare. It's likely in many areas it's okay, but there is going to be inequalities, and it's for all of us to try and petition for equality across the system and for people who need drugs to be able to get it. Oh, I absolutely agree. So, sorry, Glenn, I don't think there is a real answer to this. I do know that there's no limit in supply from GSK. I know that much. Um, so quite why people are running into shortages, but I, I do think that the dismantling of the CMDUs has been problematic and the ongoing reviews of various therapies are also causing problems in the UK. Um, at the moment, I think we're left with community treatment for Paxlovid and in hospital as a different care pathway. So I do think it's tricky. If you have something to say very quickly before I close, then then you're more than welcome. Glenn, did you uh, say do we know that Sotrivimab is working with the current variants or should we be looking at rem possibly remdesivir? Gina? Ryan? Yeah, I know that um, 
as far as BA286, it has a mutation K356T that adds a glycan and uh, seems to very much inhibit the effectiveness of citrovimab. It's also, citrovimab, we see a lot of sequences in sort of chronically, especially chronic patients where uh, they have an E340 mutation that just totally eliminates any effectiveness of citrovimab. So I think it's a pretty easily escaped one. It, I don't know, it may help some people. Um, but I also think, you know, why are we not developing more? You know, I think it's, I think it needs to be similar to the vaccines. You know, we have to have vaccines that are updated and we have to have monoclonals that are updated. And there's no, I think a lot of people are like, well, can we get a treatment that works, you know, forever? Well, probably not, you know, and until you have something, you have to have research into updating these things. You know, we, we owe it to the people um, who are still vulnerable to, uh, to, to do this research and have treatments for them. Completely agree. Len, extremely quickly. Yeah, Ryan, I think you're right. We need to keep our pipelines up and running. I think there's a few companies which are doing that at the moment, and we just need to keep telling them that this is important because it can be updated if we want it to, and the population what needs it. So thank you, Ryan. Yeah, and and definitely, and, and one area where we're really short if remdesivir does get taken away is in juvenile infection. So there's no therapies there. So listen, guys, I'm sorry we have overrun, and um, but I did feel it was an important discussion to continue, and we have had some fantastic guests. Thank you for all of the questions. Sorry we didn't get to all of them. We'll carry them over to next time. Um, but we hope that the main session did cover many essential topics and at least answered some of your queries and, and thoughts around how this virus and, and our immunity are changing. And of course, how we should be dealing with this going forwards and those most effective. And of course, the question of long COVID, I think, as everyone has said, is scientifically extremely well made now. And it, it just pains me that the gaslighting that people are experiencing with respect to this condition continues. So thank you. Sheena and Aris for putting together this, the session questions and to Shasha and Ryan for joining us and of course to all my panel members at, at, at Independent Sage. And we will see you in a couple of weeks time. So until then, take care and keep safe. And sorry for overrunning, but I think it was worth it. Take care, everybody. Have a good weekend.